Okay, let's get started. Uh, before we start, I want to mention that other speakers in the session should see the AV team to get mic'd up. This is our last session of the day on ZK implementations. And our first speaker is giving an invited talk, Jordi Bellina from Polygon. We'll talk about how to build an opcode compatible ZK EVM. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Jordi Bailina. I'm the technical lead at Polygon Hermes. During the last uh, year, my team and myself, we have been building uh, ZK ABM compatible. The title is a little bit challenging for half an hour, but I'm going to try to do my, going to try to do my best. Okay, I'm going to try to try to go a little bit deep on how exactly we built this ZK ABM. I'm not going to explain what's a roll up. Uh, what we are trying to build is a ZK EVM, so it's mainly it's a scaling Ethereum. Uh, the rollup has a, a, a lot of pieces. You know, we have a node, have a bridge, have smart contracts, have a lot of pieces, have a you know, have a different pieces. But I'm going to focus very much in the in the prover part of the of the uh, L2 of this rollup. What this what we want to prove? Okay, so what 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 proof we want to build? Okay, so the idea that we want to build is we have a an state. We have transactions. These transactions are not, so these transactions are Ethereum transactions, transactions that can be generated, for example, with MetaMask or any Ethereum wallet. So our, these transactions can include transfers, but can also include uh, deploying a smart contracts or executing some code of a smart contract. So any valid Ethereum transaction should be valid, and then we compute a new state. So mainly what we want to prove, mainly what we're building is a proof that's Ethereum inside. So we want to build a proof that takes a transaction and executes exactly the same way that Ethereum does. This is what it means for a code compatible. It's even more. It's Ethereum compatible, uh, what we want to build. Okay? So how we, how, we, how we build that? Okay? Um, if the, the first approach is try to use uh, Circum. Okay? So that's the, 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 the tool that we had. And if you think about that, the number of constraints, that it's, it's not feasible. You know, it's, uh, with this, we will have a lot of gates. This is like building uh, a processor without a clock. You know, just having a lot of gates and a lot of uh, uh, constraints in this case, and this would be like impossible. So we need to, have to, to use another model, and the other model is it's equivalent in hardware when we invent the clock. You know, when we have, the, when we have a clock we, with a small electronics, and with a clock we are repeating this uh, operation many times. Mainly what we have here is a state machine. Okay, we have a state machine, and with this we are repeating the same thing many times, and uh, this is why the computers uh, can do a lot of things and really fast. So the idea is very much the same. So what we are using here is instead of using signals, we are using polynomials. You can understand polynomial if you want as a set of, uh, as a set of, uh, um, a set of values, a set of signals, and then we have a state transition function, so something that you go from one state to uh, another state. Okay, and if we have a state machines, the same way, uh, then we can have, we can build a processor, and if we can build a processor, we can then create an assembly that actually execute a code in this processor, and what we are doing is we, we have a processor that uh, emulates the Ethereum state machine. So it's a processor with a specific assembly code, and we program on top of this processor with assembly all the rules of, uh, of Ethereum state machine. Okay, so this is the strategy. The strategy is first build a kind of a processor. From this processor, build uh, um, an, an assembly and, in, and write Ethereum on that, on that assembly. For writing this processor, Okay, it's not easy to write. So for this, we, we, we created a kind of a language. We call it polynomial identity language. I'm going to explain it a little bit that. That's the, what we call it PIL. And this is very useful for writing this uh, processor part. Sometimes we call it the, the hardware layer. Yeah, actually, it's not hardware because this is uh, arithmetic. It's algebra. But, uh, all the, but the idea is very much that. It's, uh, instead of having transistors, you have uh, polynomials. But uh, we are building processors. Okay, we are building a state machine. We define a state machine that goes from one state to the other. And an assembly is just a normal assembly. It's a specific assembly for this special processor. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Okay, but this is the strategy 
that we follow. So um, let's see um, this pill, so how we build the hardware. So let's start from the bottom, from the bottom layer, okay? So the bottom layer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna do the hello world. I'm gonna explain you the hello world of this hardware processor, okay? Uh, the hello world would be um, a Fibonacci series. This is a circuit that actually you, you, this, you, you want to prove that you know two numbers, that when you apply the Fibonacci series uh, 1,024 times, it gives a specific number, okay? So this would be the, like the public, the public output, and you have the private inputs and all the intermediate, the intermediate signals. Of course, if you want to write that in circum, you can do it quite easy. This is a circum language. This is write it in circum. This is signal by signal. But we are interested in write it in, in PIL. So how we do? Well, the first we need to build a state machine. Actually, the, the cool thing of, of a Fibonacci, and this is why it's very used, it's used very much in the literature, is because a Fibonacci is a state machine. And again, if we have a state machine, we can have a processor. Okay, that's why it's important, this, 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 this example. So, well, in this case, we have a state machine, in this case, with two states. In this case would be like the, old, the last state and the before last state, so we have two states, and then we have a rule to compute the next state. So the next state, we're just shifting, so the before last state is the last state, and the last state actually is the addition of the last two states. This is typical in the Fibonacci series. Okay, so we have like two states. In this case, we will have two polynomials. As you see, the polynomials well, for just for people in polynomials, it's values. We, the values are evaluation to the roots of unit. I don't gonna extend in that side, but we can, this, all these, all these, um, so all these, see, all these, um, ah, it doesn't work, okay. Well, uh, all these um, uh, column itself is uh, a polynomial represented, it's a polynomial of degree 1023. Okay, and is represented by these uh, evaluations, are not coefficients, are evaluations, and we have the other, we have the other polynomial, okay? And we define the state transition function in this case, okay? Actually, here we have a little bit, of, a little problem, I'm not, a little problem that's the, this state, this state transition function needs to be cyclic. So the last one needs to, uh, uh, fills, need to fulfill also with the first one. So in the case of a, a Fibonacci series, this would work very well for this space, but the, the, the first with the last, it doesn't match. So for that, we define another polynomial, which is the, the, it's a polynomial that's uh, everything is zeros, ex, uh, except in the last step, that's one. And this is a pre-compute polynomial or a constant polynomial that we call it, we call it is, is last, okay? So in PIL, this would look something like this. We would define uh, is last, is constant, is a predefined co the polynomial. We would define two polynomials, that the two states the, the, that are, will be committed, the before last and the last. And here we define the rules, okay? Here the, the prime is the next state. So here what we are saying is that the before last is equal to the last. But we want this condition only to fill in the case that is last is zero. So one minus is one, one minus is last is, uh, so if his last is one, then it's gonna be zero and it does, it, this condition do, does not have to fulfill, okay? So we have these uh, two conditions, okay? And at the end, we also need to define what's the public input. In this case, the public input is gonna be just the output, it's gonna be the last element of the, uh, the last element of the, uh, last, uh, a last uh, uh, polynomial, okay? And here, we also need to define the condition, the polynomial condition, to define that uh, uh, the, this public variable uh, is equal to a last in the, in the is last. Okay, so here we have what would be the hello world of uh, an example. So you can see here that we can build processors on top of that. Here, uh, to extend a little bit, uh, to extend a little bit that, um, uh, well, here you can, you can, with this, if we want to write a full application, this would be the pill, but actually we need a little bit of code, a little bit of extra code. We need a code to write the constants, the, the polynomial. In the first case, we are just saying that, well, we are filling a polynomial that's zero everywhere ex ex except the last line that's one, and then we have an execute, something that we need, so it's a, like the Windows computation, something that every time that we want to execute, given an input, we need to compute all the trace of all the polynomials. So we need to create those polynomials. This would be the equivalent of creating the, the, of creating the, the, the Windows generation. And once we have this polynomial with the pill, we are done. That's the cool thing. We don't need to do anything else. We can already 
generate, uh, we are kind of ready to generate a proof system. Actually, this is, this in the left side, we are just uh, calling the normal, you know, this, this uh, construction of the pre-computed polynomials. We are calling the, the, the execution for a specific site. And in the right side, we already have with uh, uh, Pilcom and Pilastark, we can generate automatically a Stark that generates, so a, a, a proof of Stark that generates that. So we generate the, the setup phase. We have the, here the, the Stark the generation, the proof generation part, and, of, and the verifier. So that's it. That's the only thing that we need. And this is the cool thing of the pill. We need to write the pill. We write the, we write the code to compute the uh, constant polynomials or the precomputed polynomials. We write the code to, to compute the committed polynomials or the polynomials that are filled. And, and we already have the full, the full proof. But not only that. In, with this language, we also implement, for example, permutation checks. How we do a permutation check? Well, it's very easy. If we have two polynomials and we want to... Uh, to uh, guarantee that two polynomials, one is the uh, permutation of the other, we just write it this way, A is B. And that means that this, this will be uh, the permutation check. We can do that not only for a single column, we can do that for many columns, and even we can also, for example, create a selector. In this case, for example, we have four out of the eight points that must, be, must fit the other fourth of the eight of the other side. Okay, so this is, and we write, in this way, we have a selector, the polynomials that we want to, 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 to check the permutation is whatever, whatever it is, okay? We have exactly the same for a plugup, uh, for a plugup. A plugup is just an inclusion. So the, all the numbers in the polynomial needs to be included in the other polynomial. We write it that way, in the state of is, is in. A must, must be in B, okay? And of course, we also have for multi-column and with selectors. Okay, so this is, uh, as you can see, this is quite powerful for creating all the operations. We will see later a little bit how we use that. Okay, and the last thing that we can do in, 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 in PIL is um, also create these copy constraints. People that know Splunk will, this will sound familiar with that, but the idea is that I can define a polynomial that it's, um, I can define a polynomial here that, and I want to guarantee that maybe the second position is the same that the sixth, uh, that, that the seventh position, okay? Or that this position is exactly the same that this one. How do I do that? Well, I create, here is a permutation polynomial, which is the identity polynomial, but just uh, with cycles on the, on, the, on the positions that I want. For example, in this case, uh, in the sixth and, uh, the sixth and the first is are commuted. But if we have three, this is just shifted one, one another. So we have the permutation polynomial and in PIL, of course, we have the S in general is going to be a constant polynomial, a precomputed polynomial, and we just say A connects S, okay? And again, we also can do that with multiple columns, okay? And, well, this is if you have three columns, you can copy constraint from one polynomial to the other. So with this, for example, writing Plonk is, is, is quite easy. Here would be the example of Plonk. People that know Plonk, this would sound familiar. You have, we have three committed polynomials, A, B, C. We have uh, three uh, permutation, so copy constraints, permutation polynomials, S, A, S, B, and C. We have a QL, QR, QR, QM, QO, QC, which is the generic uh, gate of the Plonk. And here in this case, we also have a, a one public input. So uh, we have this. We have the connection polynomials, and then here we have the, the, the equation, the, the polynomial equation that fills that. So, with this, uh, you can see that with this is, is very cool, but for example, we can create, uh, we can have, for example, for example, a circum, we can ha create, have any, any circuit and uh, have a, a pill, and, of and then we have a Stark uh, uh, on top of that, okay? Um, just for uh, notification in circum, we, add for we added for, uh, the, the, the custom gates. Custom gates are uh, just normal templates that do not have uh, constraints. And the idea is that you can replace, you can read that in the R1CS file and um, uh, put them explicitly. So you can create what's called custom gates or custom templates uh, you can define. For example, in this case, this is a, a complex an extension field multiplication. And we do that with a specific custom gate. Uh, so we can, and the cool thing is that in this thing is that you can use the, so you can use all the witness generation that Circum provides. So all the witness generation is exactly the same. We have the R1CS, we have all the, the R1CS constraints and we can convert automatically to, to PIL. Okay, so this is, allows us to 
uh, work in the both worlds. We can have things that are very good in writing in circum and writing some specific circuits for one thing, and things that are uh, more state machines. And we allow this allows us to connect one thing to the other and work work in the work in the two in the two worlds. Okay. Um, We should, well, with this, we generate the pill. And the other thing that we have implemented with pill is that we have all the recursion part implemented. So with pill Stark, we can, uh, once we have a pill, we can generate um, a circum circuit that verifies that proofs. Okay? And this circuit can be compiled again with pill, you know, just having a recursion in Stark, or it can also be. Uh, computed in, it can also be generated in normal circum and then generate a snark J, uh, with a snark.js, a plonk or a gross 16. And this is very good because this allows us to create a, a proof that's huge. We are using a set of layers for, uh, for, uh, for packing and for reducing the Stark. So we have different re Stark recursions and at the end we convert this Stark to, to, to uh, normal snark uh, gross 16 or, or, or plonk. For this recursion Stark, I think we have a talk later that will explain a little bit more about Plonky2 and a lot of details that how we are using from Polygon. Okay, so we have this verification of a Stark with flag, which is cool. This saves a lot of gas, also for the for the zkVN. Okay, but okay, how we build? We have all this tooling uh, for writing circuits and for writing the proofs and generating. But actually, we need to write the we want to solve this problem, okay? We want to prove, we want to generate this processor and write the code. So let's, let's go a little bit deeper how we do that, okay? So the first thing that we need to build is the processor, okay? Processor mainly is, uh, if you understand a processor, mainly is a set of registers that have a state transition, do operations that generate another state, uh, state registers. They used to have a program counter, so something uh, that says what you are executing, and in general, half a ROM, okay? So in this case, for example, is how we define, this is a simple example, but how we define five registers. And in this case, the in A, in B, in C, this is the, the instruction. It's part of the instruction, but actually, instruction you can understand of a, a program is a set of polynomials where each line of the polynomial, or of each, each row, is a, a, an instruction. So an instruction is a lot of values from different polynomials, okay? Uh, these values can be in A, in B, in C. You, we, we, you can compact them to a single one, but actually we already have uh, extended, okay? And so there is gonna be a program, is there's assembly that's gonna convert an assembly to these uh, polynomials that are gonna be the, the program, okay? So in this case, for example, if we want to do a normal move of a processor, we want to move from A to B, then in this case, in A would be one, set B would be one, and the, all the others, part of the instruction, are gonna be zero. So here, we define a, it's an intermediate value, here it's not committed, it's just an intermediate value. We say that this OP is uh, in A times A, plus in B times B, plus in C times C, okay? So if in A is, uh, is one, it, this is gonna be A, and the other is gonna be zero, so you have selected A, and then we are setting A prime, here we're saying if set A is, a is one, then we are gonna set OP to A, and if not, we are gonna keep the last, the last value. This is very much what we are saying here. Also, as part of the instruction, we have a, a one part of the polynomial which is constant. This is for immediate values, so we can have an instruction to, uh, for example, if I want to put a seven to this register, we can do it this way. And also another thing that's important for this is, is we, can, can, we have a kind of special input that we call it free in. And the idea is that when it's a free in, at that instruction, you can set any value that you want. This is for non-deterministic computations. Sometimes, for example, I want to do a division. What I put is the, 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 the put the values of the multiplication and then I, I, I just check the other one. So we allow this, if they, they, there are instructions that are gonna allow you to put some specific value. Of course, you need to be very careful because then you need to check that what you are putting here is it, it, gonna, it, it, it's, it's constrained somehow, okay? We have, uh, we have also uh, conditional, uh, conditional jumps. This is very important for a processor. Conditional jump at the end is just uh, 
working with the program counter. So in general, the program counter is going to be the next state of the program counter is going to be the, the current program counter plus one. But if there is a jump condition, uh, it's going to go to somewhere else. And if you have a conditional jump, it's going to be to a different, to a different place. And for conditional jumps, here we have just uh, an algebraic uh, way to detecting E0. People that's is E0, the people that's familiar with circum, but it's the, the same rules applies, applies here. Okay. So, okay, we have a processors, okay? But here is, okay, we have a processor, we have a polynomials, but in the, in the instructions, we can put any, the value that we, so we can, we, in the, in, with, with just with this, we can execute any instruction that you want. So how we force that we execute a specific ROM, a specific program on that? Well, the idea is we have the instruction, the instruction if you want is a set of, or the set of polynomials that define the instructions. We have also the program counter, and on the other side we have the program itself, which is a set of instructions to, and then we have the program line. We start from zero, one, two, three, four, five. And then with a simple plug up, if, if we say, if we're executing the line one, that's the one that's set by the program counter, then it must be this line, because there is only one line one in the program. So we are forcing that we are executing the ROM, the, the program that we are executing. So what we are doing here is just writing a ROM. So what we need to do is just write a ROM, to, uh, uh, to execute whatever we, want to, to whatever we want to execute, okay? Here are some other details. For example, when we talk about memory, which is interesting, uh, the idea of the memory is that we have a set of uh, instructions that are reads memories and writes memories, and the idea is that we um, sort, so we, we put all these same instructions, but we resort, we resort all these instructions in, in just order, sorted by address, and inside the address, and then the, the counter. With the counter is the, the, the trace, the trace counter, the, the position so that, at which line we are executing. And then with a single with a single permutation check, we are just checking that this because and because this is sorted by address. The idea is that all the reads and the writes are done like in a single register. We have a single register where you do all the reads and the writes. Of course, here we need to check that this is sorted. Here there is some uh, some um, range checks for doing this uh, uh, to guarantee this sort, and you know there is some some code here. But they, this is the the biggest idea for the for the memory. Okay, and for example, for arithmetic, we have some specific. Uh, uh, state machines that are doing some specific uh, um, operations, like for example, we have a one of those that's arithmetic in uh, uh, arithmetic in 2056 bits, for example. We, and then the idea is that with a single plug up, we are just on the selectors, we are just uh, linking the what's executed in the in the in the main in the main processor is linked with the what's executed in these special state machines that's doing a specific job that's uh, doing arithmetic operations. Okay. The, the, the EBM has uh, much more uh, um, components. We talk about RAM, we talk about ROM. Of course, there is a storage. There was storage at the end. Is, this is a full processor. It's like a, another processor that's handling um, uh, a sparse Merkle tree. We have additions, adds, and it's a specific processor to handle the, the storage. We have also Binary operations. This is mainly what we do: is we divide by bytes, and, and, and then we do the operation with a normal plug up uh, uh, byte to byte, and then we pack them again. Uh, we have the arithmetic that we talk, and then we have all the all the all the hashing. Hashing. We are working with two hashes mainly: the uh, Poseidon, which is very very friendly and very cheap, and this is very much for the storage and for, for example, for uh, coding for for hashing the programs. Okay, but then we have Ketchak for keeping compatibility uh, for keeping compatibility with Ethereum. It's not only the hash, the internal hash function. Here is all the paddings, and here is a lot of uh, uh, it's, an, it's, it's a lot of uh, work there for the for the for the for the hashing. Okay, we have the ROM. Uh, the ROM. I'm going to show you a little bit how it looks like. So. The, the idea is, for example, this is the assembly of the ROM. Here, for example, is how we implement the different opcodes in Ethereum. We have a, well, we have a stop, deletion, and all of them. Here you see the assembly, for example, this is the movement. You know, we have this movement, we are doing SP to SP, well, we have different ideas. The dollar is, this is the, when you see a dollar here, is mainly for the free input, the, the ones that's non-deterministic uh, inputs. And here is the, actually the instruction that we are executing itself, okay? And this is all the code. This is Ethereum. 
uh, encoded with this uh, a specific uh, a specific assembly uh, altogether. Okay. Let's see this. Okay. We already talked a little bit about the, the proving here. Uh, the idea, the, the, the other, the, probably the interesting thing here is that what we are working very much right now is we can have different proof for different blocks, but then we can aggregate those blocks with uh, Stark, and then at the end we have this uh, uh, gross 16 or Plonk that actually uh, proof is uh, on Ethereum. Okay, and uh, um, yeah, a couple of things here for testing. Uh, well, uh, the cool thing of doing a, a, a compatible EVM probably is the only coolest thing is that we can use all the Ethereum testing uh, suite. Ethereum has a bunch of tests, thousands uh, of tests already branched, and because we want to be as much compatible as Ethereum, we are running all and we adapt all the tests, uh, all the Ethereum tests uh, to run with this EVM. Currently, uh, about 70% of the tests are, are, are passing, the others. Of course, when you are getting close to 100%, they are more difficult here. There are very, very uh, strange X cases, and you know it's uh, an important test suite, but it's a good path just to, to, to follow. And uh, yeah, and here I give you some, some numbers on the prover. Here, of course, is a process of, of, of optimization, but the, the, the conclusion of the prover is that, uh, um, well, actually, for example, uh, well, the conclusion of the prover very much is that the cost, at currently at the cost, the cost per transaction that we are calculating for the proof generation, the computation cost, uh, it's under uh, one penny, uh, one uh, dollar, so one dollar, one penny dollar. But there is still a lot of improvements, uh, a lot of improvements uh, um, here to do. Things that goes from uh, improving the, the sustained machines, working maybe with less polynomials, improving the hardware. We are working, for example, with some uh, hardware acceleration like uh, GPUs and, and uh, FPGAs uh, uh, idea, improving the, the algorithms, the proving algorithm. So there is a lot of margin here to, to, to do, but currently we are, I think we are quite good. The, the, the standard proof works with, with it's about, uh, it's 600 polynomials of two to the 23. Okay, and the proof in a big machine takes something between five and ten minutes, depending 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 a little bit on the on the proof. Okay, but that's that are cool numbers, and but this is just the, the starting the starting point. Okay, and the roadmap just before end the question when mainnet where the mainnet is going to be when it's safe, and uh, we don't know that. This is probably the biggest challenge that we have uh, right now is how we. This here, as you see, there is a lot of new things, and all new things needs to be audited and tested. Here we ask for help, uh, but uh, this is probably the most challenging part that we are first, that we are facing that we are facing at this point. And well, yeah, the last thing is everything is uh, all this is open source. We are already open source a couple of months ago. Actually, even the, all the tooling part for the people, if people is interested in writing things on tooling, this is already licensed as uh, as uh, MIT or Apache, so you can you can actually use, and everything is uh, visible here. Okay, and that's very much my presentation. <laughs> we have two minutes right. here. We have a couple of minutes for questions. If you have questions, uh, please line up at the microphones. Actually, I'll, I'll ask about the performance, the specific performance. Like, uh, suppose you wanted to run it on a on a laptop, on a Mac, and you were trying to prove, you know, single simple transfer transaction. How long would it take to generate that proof? Transfer transaction. Uh, well, let me let me. I, I need to do some numbers. Let me. Uh, so the the standard proof. So, well, let's see. A standard look. Uh, five thousand gas. Five thousand gas, which is about twenty transactions. This uh, would take in a laptop, which is eight times slower than the current proof. It would take uh, so eight times something between forty and forty and one hour. If you do a division, so if you divide one hour by twenty, this would be two three minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. in a laptop. And, and, and the reason you had to break it up into multiple Stark proofs is that because of memory constraints, or is there a, is some other reason? Sorry, the the reason you had to do multiple Stark proofs, like recursive yeah, Stark proofs, is that this because is, of memory? Yeah, this is this is so the, the, this is very much for 
compressing the, the compressing the proof. So the, the, the idea is that in the first iteration we are using a, a very low blow up factor because we have a lot of polynomials. So the idea is we are just using a blow up factor of two. So we have we need to do a lot of queries. So the proof is really big and it's really expensive. So in the second layer we are we are actually uh, going to a higher blow up factor. We have less polynomials because the, the prover is smaller. And then the third one is, is even smaller, so we are like compressing very much. So at the end, we have to verify a very small or a very cheap uh, um, uh, Stark. And then we do this last step with, uh, a gross, with a normal circuit, growth plonk uh, on the last side. But all this process is mainly to, well, it's for two things. It's for reducing the, the for reducing and being able to prove this in a gross thing and plonk and, 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 and lowering the verification cost. And there is also this aggregation. Also, the, 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 the idea the, the having this recursion allows us to aggregate different proofs from different blocks and compress them to a single proof and verify that to a single proof. So these two the, the main two reasons why we are using this, uh, this thing. Hi, um, I just want to ask uh, what is uh, like the concrete difference between using R1CS uh, to construct a, 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 a ZKUM circuit and using a state uh, table uh, to, for, for, for that circuit. So how much difference? Because uh, as you know, there is a lot of uh, very efficient algorithms, uh, ZKP algorithms for, for R1CS. So I think uh, if you can just like uh, Build a ZKVM on, on the RNCS will be more like efficient. But but, but I, I I just wonder um, how much difference is a, is a uh, on the on the, like the circuit side or number of constraints in the in the two the uh, difference two, 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 two the diff yeah. yeah the difference is huge uh, actually is uh, if you try to do it in R1CS uh, it's impossible or at least mm -hmm. for me you know here uh, in this room there is people that. Uh, has been done very crazy things in R1CS. I see, I seen a painting, I seen a painting write it in R1CS, for me it's crazy, okay? But okay. it's expensive, okay? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a painting, maybe it's 20 million constraints and it's just a painting. Uh, uh, for if you want to do uh, huge proofs, mm -hmm. uh, you cannot do it in R1CS because in R1CS, every time that you do an instruction, you need to put, you need to put a constraint and this is limited. The idea of doing it with this state machine is that uh, it's like a processor. So you can, you can, you can have processors, so you can uh, use the clocks. Uh, uh, so you are repeating the same thing like many times. So you don't need to prove uh, everything individually. You can do it in parallel. And this is why you work in polynomials. You are doing the things in parallel. So you can have high, larger polynomials that are uh, proving much more, much more things. Okay. okay. So, uh, just uh, give you an idea. Okay. So this is uh, I told I told you that we are 600 polynomials. So we are working with 600 polynomials. Each polynomial mm -hmm. is 2 to the 23, which is 8 millions. Okay. So actually, this is like 600 times 8 millions. This is would be equivalent to the number of constraints that you would need for R1CS. But not even that, because if you are trying to build a, a, a processor, you would have to even have a much more constraints because uh, you need to have all the, all, the, all the possibilities and you are not using all the possibilities. So it's just not feasible, okay? And with this technique, actually we can, we, we can do it. So it's the, this is the big difference uh, doing this. And, and being able to mix the two things, this allows us to, for example, the Ketchak, the Ketchak works very good for a circuit. Because the circuit is, it, you know, it's at the end it's, not, it's a binary circuit. We are doing that in parallel, and this works very good for doing. So we can use circum for writing, for example, the Kekar circuit, and then putting the result and plugging it with plug up to to the main to the main uh, 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 processor. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, I think we are done, right? <laughs> I, I don't think we have time for any more questions. I'm gonna be here outside, so any question, just open to to, to answer. Right there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Pratyush Mishra, Mishra from UC Berkeley, who's going to talk about ArcWorks, a Rust ecosystem for ZK Snorks.
Uh, no, I just need to present. Um, okay. Okay. Should we wait for people to settle down? Are we taking a break or? Ari? Are we taking a break or? No, I can just stop. Okay. Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for coming. I'm Pratyush, and today I'll be talking about ArcWorks, which is a Rust ecosystem of libraries for programming and developing ZK SNARKs. This is a joint work of a lot of contributors at Berkeley, as well as uh, a lot of other uh, university as well, uh, universities as well as companies. OK? So let's get started. OK, I guess this doesn't work. I will just use this. OK, so what is a ZK SNARK? Hopefully, people ha here have heard of that, but if you haven't, I'll do a quick recap. A ZK SNARK is basically a protocol between two parties, a prover and a verifier. And the prover's goal is to convince the verifier that some statement is true without revealing too much information and without requiring the verifier to do a lot of work. In a little bit more detail, the prover wants to convince the verifier that some function f is satisfied on a public input x and a private input that only the prover knows w. Okay? And it does so by sending over um, a very small, very succinct uh, proof, which the verifier can, can check efficiently. Okay? The two properties that we're interested in are zero knowledge, which ensures that the proof hides information about the prover's secret uh, witness, W, and succinctness, which means that the proof is small and is quick to check. All right? OK, so this is, you know, seems like a very abstract and opaque primitive, but it actually has tons of applications already in the blockchain space. So things like uh, private transactions, that maybe you know, we should be careful about the tornado cache there. <laughs> um, scalable and private smart contract systems, uh, of which there are numerous, such as um, what we just heard about from Jordi. Uh, decentralized multiplayer games, such as Dark Forest, as well as many more. Right, which hopefully we'll see uh, deployed in the near future. Okay. All right, so this is you know, obviously very exciting, but how do you actually develop an application which relies on ZK SNARKs, right? And today it's like a lot of work. What I mean by that is to design your application, first you have to express your computation in a language that the ZK SNARK understands, right? The ZK SNARK doesn't understand something like C or Python, you need to express it in some uh, for example, the IR that, uh, or the IL that Jordi talked about. Okay? So there's quite a few frameworks for doing this. Um, so you have to first you know, choose one and then express your problem in that framework. All right? So once you've done that, you're not quite done yet. Because you have to figure out what ZK SNARK actually works for your use case. Do you really want really small, succinct proofs? Or are you OK with like, you know, medium-sized proofs? Do you care about zero knowledge or not? And this leads to you know, a plethora of choices. There's basically a snark for whatever trade-off you would like to make. All right, so OK, you've done that. You've chosen your snark. Are you done? Well, not quite yet, right? Because you have to decide what algebraic objects, such as an elliptic curve or finite field, you need to instantiate your snark with, right? So there's options here, again, like BLS12381, BLS12377, Ristretto, pasta curve, so many, right? And OK, now that you've done that, you're still not necessarily done. You might still, if you choose like a novel elliptic curve, you have to create an efficient and optimized implementation of this elliptic curve or finite field, right? And again, there's a lot of decisions to be made here. If your modulus has a special form, then you might be able to do specialized modular reductions. You might have special endomorphism-based scalar multiplications. Sort of the list is endless, right? So as a result of this, right, what we find today is that there's numerous SNARK frameworks which all re-implement parts of this sequence of, uh, I guess, the this, this stack. Uh, and none of them all have like sort of a joint comprehensive uh, implementation of everything that you would want, right? So things like SOCOM, NARC, LibSNARK, Bellman, and its sort of ecosystem of forks, right? They all implement a variety of um, proving algorithms and elliptic curves and so on, right? And they're all often subtly incompatible, or maybe not just subtly, just completely incompatible to reuse with each other. Okay, and why is this? It's because 
Snarks, you know, they, they are a very cool object, but they're also a very heavy cryptographic object, right? So there's a lot of optimization that you need to do to overcome the overhead um, that this cryptography imposes upon you. Okay, so each team does its own optimization. Um, and there's, you know, it's a very fast moving space, so every few months there's a completely new technique or algorithm which, um, you know, sort of changes the trade-offs that you can make. Um, and you might have sort of existing constraints on your code base. So if it's written in Go, you might want to use a Go-based framework like NARC, for example, okay? So, okay, so this, this works. You know, there's like a lot of successful projects which uh, have come up in the ecosystem because of this, but there are also a few problems. Namely, there's a ton of wasted re-implementation effort, right? Everybody implements their own version of the optimization and sort of, you know, notes aren't shared between these optimizations or between these implementations. So these optimizations are scattered across library. Libraries upgrading becomes difficult, right? So if you change from Rust to Go, for example, you might have to completely switch out your uh, proving framework. And furthermore, the attention of the community with respect to auditing and fixing bugs is sort of split across all these different efforts, right? So no one project gets a lot of eyes, gets a lot of uh, effort to um, you know, find the bugs and fix them. All right, so how do we overcome these issues? That's what I'm you know, trying, going to try and propose uh, in this talk. And one, one solution that uh, we can try is to make it very easy to reuse a single sort of library or set of libraries, right? So if you make it very low friction, then people might naturally gravitate towards that and uh, you know, be inclined to contribute their improvements to that library, right? To do this, we have to make it so that the library is uh, modular, so you know anybody can mix and match the various components of the library and pick up what they need and discard what they don't need without um, you know causing efficiency uh, overheads. Next, it should be ergonomic to use the library, right? So you should be able, easy to write secure protocols by default, and then integrate these into your existing code base, um, yeah, without having to do uh, you know jump through a number of hoops. And finally, you know, at the end of all this, there's, nobody's going to use your library if it's just a toy, right? It has to be efficient. It should be easy to get performance that matches uh, sort of the best handwritten, hand-customized, specialized implementations, right? Or at least, you know, be within a ballpark. Don't be like, you know, 10x worse. And basically, what we try to do with ArcWorks is try to achieve all three of these goals uh, with the Rust uh, ecosystem of libraries, all right? So in terms of modularity, we strongly leverage the Rust type system, um, in particular the generics and trait uh, the system there, to abstract away, away irrelevant details at each level of the stack. So if you're programming, you know, just writing constraints, you don't really necessarily have to care about how your snark is implemented or how your elliptic curves are implemented, right? So we want to be able to abstract that away, and we use traits to do that. In terms of ergonomics, uh, we again use this type system to in encapsulate implementation details and hide uh, irrelevant information from you know, people programming at higher levels of the stack to offer and offer secure defaults, right? So by default, you're gonna be doing the correct thing and not uh, shoot yourself in the foot. Finally, uh, in terms of efficiency, we have, uh, we offer state-of-the-art um, arithmetic at the lowest levels and also state-of-the-art constraint programming um, as you move up the stack, okay? So in a little bit more detail, we'll <coughs> see how uh, the kinds of, how ArcWorks achieves all these properties at various levels of the ZK Snark stack, starting from the very bottom, which is, um, yeah, the algebraic or arithmetic, or uh, I guess finite field arithmetic, elliptic curve arithmetic uh, portion. Then we'll see how uh, we achieve these properties at the next level up, which is implementing snarks and implementing constraints. And finally, we'll see how, uh, yeah, ArcWorks provides this, this functionality when you're actually implementing applications which, you know, re require programming <coughs> constraints for your ZK snark. Okay, so let's get started by focusing on algebra first. So the deal is that Almost every ZK snark that we use today requires efficient arithmetic over some finite field, right? So think numbers model over prime, right? As well as efficient polynomial arithmetic over these fields. So you can define a polynomial over these fields, and you need to be able to multiply, divide, add these polynomials efficiently. You also have to do things like elliptic curve arithmetic 
for basically every popular snack you've heard of, like Plonk, Grot16, uh, Malin, and uh, many more, right? So these require implementing efficient and secure elliptic curve arithmetic. Um, so we want to be able to do this easily. We want it to be not a big overhead to actually implement new fields and new curves, but we want the performance at the same time to be almost as if you were handwriting that implementation, right? It should not be much slower. And again, we want to avoid duplicating effort, right? We want it to be the case that if I'm implementing two, for example, short Weierstrass curves, I shouldn't have to implement the addition formula again and again, right? Because as we all know, copy pasting leads to a bunch of errors which are hard to diagnose. Okay, so on the ergonomics front, what we see is if you want to implement a new elliptic curve, there's basically three things we have to do. We have to implement the associated fields, like the field that the elliptic curve is defined over, and then actually just define and implement the curve, right? Which is, you know, might involve implementing um, the arithmetic. So this, yeah, this involves specifying the curve equation coefficients and specifying the cofactor and generators. So let's see how this, what this process looks like in ArcWorks. So to implement the associated fields, all you really have to do is specify the modulus, specify the multiplicative generator for the field, and then you're done, right? So this is all. This is all it takes to define the base field for the BN254 curve. Same thing for the scalar field. You just specify the modulus, specify the generator, and then you're done. So this relies on, again, features of Rust, such as the PROC macro system, and uh, results in a very efficient and optimized implementation that matches, I don't know, um, what you would find in, in a hand-optimized implementation of BN254 in, say, LibSnark or something like that, right? Okay, so this is the fields. What about the curve itself? Like, normally, we think that implementing an elliptic curve is something which should only be done by experts, and generally, I would agree, but the goal of ArcWorks has been to make that really easy. And so to implement the BN254 G1 group, all you have to do is specify your base field, your scalar field, which we just defined a second ago. Specify the cofactor, it's just one because it's a prime order curve, and some other technical thing. And then we specify the curve coefficients, right? So we specify the A coefficient, which is zero, the B coefficient, which is three in this case, and the generators for the curve, right? And then we're done. This is all. This is all it takes to, to implement the BN254 group, uh, G1 group, in, in ArcWorks, right? So if you have a new elliptic curve that you come up with for whatever reason, you can implement it with this much, with only this much effort. And, you know, this is not condensed for the purposes of the talk. You can actually go and look at our uh, repo on GitHub and find it, find the exact same thing, maybe with a few more comments. Okay. All right, so as a result of this you know, simplicity and ease of implementation, we've, we've been able to implement a lot of elliptic curves in ArcWorks, starting from the entire BLS12381 ecosystem, BN254, as you just saw, the pasta cycle of curves, which is being used in Zcash and Mina, uh, BLS12377, which is like a chain of uh, pairing-friendly elliptic curves, as well as, a, as uh, popular cycles of uh, pairing-friendly curves, right? So whatever your project is, you can probably implement your elliptic curve in, um, in ArcWorks. We have other ones such as SecP256 and the corresponding cycle uh, also coming uh, very soon. Okay? All right, so that's on the ergonomics front. From a modularity perspective, right, <clears throat> we have designed our traits and interfaces so that it's very easy to switch between fields and elliptic curves. For example, if you're doing, uh, you know, if you have an existing proof uh, application which you need to use a SNARK for, so let's say you start off with GROT16 because, you know, that's the simplest and most efficient SNARK, and you instantiate it with BN254. But later on, you find out that BN254 has, you know, reduced security, and you want to switch to a more secure elliptic curve such as BLS12381. From an implementation perspective, all you have to do is switch one type parameter, and now your proof system is using BLS12381 instead of BN254, right? So there's no, no, I mean, you always have to tweak things at the protocol level to handle the different versions and so on. But from an implementation perspective, there's nothing else you need to do. Uh, same thing for signing. So if you have Schnorr signatures, for example, then switching out the, the curve there is, again, just changing one type parameter. Okay, so, you know, it's very nice to have this modularity and ergonomics in implementing and using these elliptic curves but does it actually come at the expense of performance, right? 
And what we find is that Arcworks, uh, our implementations, live somewhat between the two extremes of completely safe Rust code, which is implemented in the Bellman ecosystem, and you know, somewhat sketchy dynamic code generation stuff, which happens in one of the state-of-the-art libraries called MCL. Right? And what we find is that Arcworks sort of lives b between these two worlds and sometimes is even more efficient. For example, the base field multiplication uh, ends up being more efficient. And these numbers are kind of also out of date. I didn't get a chance to update the benchmarks, but uh, I think in master right now, um, all these numbers are better for Arcworks. OK. So that covers um, the base layer of the stack, namely the algebra. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we achieve ergonomics and modularity for our snarks, right? So when you're developing a snark, what you care about is, number one, often opt optimized performance, right? You need, it, you need to really minimize the overhead of these ZK snarks. And second, to prevent implementation bugs, you often want to be able to check that the code that you've implemented corresponds to the math in the paper, right? This allows you to easily check where you're going wrong and what's, uh, if there's a bug or you know, if your thing is secure. Okay. And again, at this point, we don't care about the details of the underlying elliptic curves. We just want an elliptic curve, and, or we want a constraint generation framework, right? We just want our constraints, and we want our curves. Okay. So from a modularity perspective, um, again, like we saw with the elliptic curves, we can switch between proof systems also very easily. So let's say, as before, you start off with GROSS16, right? But then you realize you don't really like the sort of malleability that GROT16 offers. It doesn't offer, I guess, full um, uh, yeah, non-malleability. So you switch to GROT17, which is a non-malleable proof system, which you can just throw it into your favorite decentralized protocol, and things should just work, right? But then you realize that, oh, you don't really like the circuit-specific trusted setup that you get from these options. So you switch that out for a universal setup snark, such as Marlin or Plonk or whatever, right? And each of these steps just requires changing uh, one type parameter, in this case, which proof system you're using, OK? It doesn't require changing the circuit, doesn't require changing anything else, just um, this one type parameter, OK? Next, OK, so you've instantiated with Marlin or Plonk or whatever, right, with KZG10. You realize that, OK, you don't really like trusted setup at all, so you want to just use uh, universal setup or, uh, I guess, transparent setup. And again, you can switch out your polynomial commitment that you're using <coughs> with one type parameter to be the transparent setup, uh, the transparent scheme used, for example, in Halo 2, right? So just one type parameter, and you are now, you know, by, I guess by changing these three, four type parameters, you've completely upgraded your scheme from circuit-specific trusted setup to transparent setup, right? Um, and these are all currently implemented in Arcworks, so you could go ahead and try this today. OK, so yeah, so we have a modular ecosystem, but what about actually writing constraint? Uh, like, what about actually writing these snarks, right? Implementing these snarks? So, as I said, oftentimes we want it to be the case that the implementation follows the math very closely. And let's uh, take a, another example. Here we're trying to implement the GROT16 verifier, and what we, if you look at the uh, implementation uh, on our GROT16 repo, you'll see that it matches exactly the code, right? So, you do some multiscalar multiplication, which is exactly what's happening here. And then you do a couple of pairing products. Um, and that's exactly what's, again, happening here, right? So this is, oh, I guess we lost that. But yeah, but basically the point was that, again, we have um, an implementation which matches the math very closely, which, again, allows you to, you know, if there is a bug or if there is in somebody auditing your code base, they can just refer to the paper and refer to the, uh, to the code and match those up very easily. OK, so that covers this level in the stack. So let's move up one more level and talk about implementing applications on top um, you know, of, the, of the snark and the elliptic curve and all that, right? So at this point, we want to implement our program or whatever thing we want, whatever application we want in terms of the language of the ZK snark. And these are constraints, right? So Jordi talked about PIL. In this, so far, Arcworks, we support primarily R1CS, but we're making some efforts to generalize that infrastructure and support arbitrary Planck-style constraints. Okay, but the key idea, the key, I guess, thing that we're going for is directly writing 
algebraic constraints is painful. You don't want to be writing you know, handwritten custom gates which manually uh, construct polynomials out of your variables. You don't want to be manually writing R1CS constraints, right? And uh, so to alleviate this pain, there's a number of high-level languages that, that have a compiler which uh, emits the low-level constraints, right? But what, what often ends up happening is that as a result of this high-level to low-level approach, you end up losing performance, right? And so you sacrifice performance for ergonomics. So what we want at this level is we want to have both. We want to have our cake and eat it, too. We want good performance and ergonomic constraint writing. And we don't care about what underlying snark we're using, what underlying curves are being used by that snark, and so on. OK? So let's see how Arcworks fares on this front. Um, at the top, we have a native implementation of Karatsuba multiplication, which is basically um, a finite field multiplication algorithm. Okay. In prior libraries, for example, libsnark, this is what the corresponding constraint code would look like. Right? It's almost impossible to see you know, what corresponds to what between the two pictures. Right? And again, the auditing would be impossible um, unless you have somebody very experienced with the depths of libsnark. And in contrast, this is the code in Arcworks, right? So if you want to implement Karatsuba multiplication in a circuit in Arcworks, which is necessary for things like implementing pairings in circuits, you'll find it's very simple, right? You have the code structure looks almost exactly the same. Maybe there's a couple more references thrown in there. But otherwise, the code is identical, which makes auditing uh, and optimizing the code very easy. OK, on top of this, we have lots of nice optimizations, such as automatic uh, constant propagation and um, yeah, elimination of redundant constraints and so on. Okay. So out of this, uh, I guess, is a high-level overview of Arcworks so far. Okay. And the question we want to ask is: Has all this effort actually been useful? Are people actually, you know, using it either in industry or in academia? And the answer, thankfully, is yes. So Arcworks is used by numerous companies uh, and industry projects to implement their. Uh, zk snark protocols, right? As well as um, what we've been seeing recently is <coughs> academic teams are using Arcworks to implement um, their protocols and benchmark and compare them against other protocols in the space. Okay? And this is the joint effort of a ton of contributors over, I guess, now the past four years, I want to say. Right? So thank you a lot to all of these people. Um, and thank you to all, uh, to all of you. And if you want to get involved with Arcworks and be one of those contributors, please talk to me. We're actively looking for full-time and part-time folks. Um, yeah, so talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. OK, we have a few minutes for questions if you want to line up at the microphones. Hi. Um, Really awesome to see that you're able to modularly um, put in different curves. Uh, this might be kind of like a, it's a bit of a naive question, um, but would it be possible, or I don't even know if this is theoretically possible, but is it possible to say put in something like um, a quantum strong, uh, quantum resistant uh, um, lattice type structure and, and do zero knowledge proofs over that and would that be possible to uh, put into this kind of a system? Yeah, so for example, if we go back to duh, 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 duh. yeah, this slide, right? If you have, a, for example, a quantum-resistant polynomial commitment, you could plug that in there. And you might need to modify a couple of things to, in the Marlin implementation to be able to you know, handle, for example, the noise that's inherent in lattice um, constructions. But it should be, again, a matter of just switching out that uh, polynomial commitment as one type parameter, and then you have <clears throat> a full snark end-to-end -end based on uh, lattices. You could, switch, you could also switch it out for Fry, though we haven't, we don't have a, I guess, end-to-end -end implementation of that in Arcworks yet. And then you would have something uh, like Marlin on top of Fry, for example. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, fantastic question. Hey, so going back to the part about the equations matching the code, uh, mm -hmm. I remember, if I'm not mistaken, a while back, um, there was actually a bug in a paper where there was a typo and it made it into, I think, a library and Zcash. So I'm wondering if you do anything or think you could do anything to, you know, guard against, you know, bugs in the papers as well in the code. 
at this level of the stack, you know, in the code, we don't know how to, I can't go back and you know, read the author's minds and see what's going on in the paper. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I think at least by making the correspondence between the code and the paper clear, you can, it, if you do find these bugs, it should be easier to go in ahead and fix them. Um, otherwise, I think there's a very rich space for people to look into, I guess, formally verifying properties of SNARK, such as soundness or um, zero knowledge or other things, right? And those, those can also help catch these bugs. And it would be interesting to, Im to integrate those formal verification tools with ArcWorks so you can directly get out uh, an efficient implementation that has some notion of formal verification behind it. Thank you. Right, for, the, for the modularity section, um, you mentioned it's really easy to change the curve and proof system. I wonder, are them checked during compilation time or runtime? What could be the errors, and how do you actually report it? Yeah, so those are all, uh, the things that I showed you are all comp compile time checks. So uh, if you switch out your elliptic curve or something which, for example, doesn't satisfy, uh, maybe let's see here, right? Uh, oh no, so the animation takes a bit of time. So let's say, you know, we try to instantiate graph 16 with um, the pasta curves, which are not pairing friendly, or secp, which is not pairing friendly, right? You will get a compile time error saying that you can't do this instantiation. Um, does that answer your question? Right, okay, yeah, got it, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So uh, in the middle of your presentation, you kind of did a drive-by where you said that you were working on moving away from R1CS. Could you mention Sorry, a bit more? Sorry, can you repeat the question? In the middle of your presentation, you said you were moving, their team was moving away from R1CS and having other options. Could you talk more on that? Yeah, so this is start, sort of still in the design phase, and the aim is not to move away from R1CS, but sort of uh, provide like a common interface which can support both R1CS and other uh, constrained, uh, I guess, pro uh, systems such as Plonk-like systems, um, maybe the, AI, uh, the air systems that are used in Starks. And the idea would be to sort of factor out the back end for the constraint generation from the front end for the constraint, actually writing the constraints, and have your maybe proof system define, okay, and I support this custom gate or this ability to define uh, you know, arbitrary columns, things like that, um, and then automatically handle that for the programmer. Yeah, so this is, but this is all still very much in the design phase. Um, I mean, we're still figuring out how we would actually do this. Yeah. That sounds interesting, thank you. Awesome, thanks. Okay, uh, okay. that's all. Thank our speaker. Okay, thank you so much. And our last speaker of the session is William Bourgeau from Polygon, who will talk about Plonky 2. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Will. I work at Polygon Zero. And today I'm going to talk about Plonky 2, which is the proving system we've developed at Polygon Zero. So, Ah, here it is. Okay, so what is Plonky 2? Um, so it's a proving system. It's based on Turbo Plonk, so Plonk with custom gates. Um, as a polynomial commitment scheme, uh, we use a fry based commitment scheme. And Plonky 2 was built with one main goal in mind. It's to build the fastest um, recursive proof system possible. And there's a bunch of cool features, for example, you can tune some parameters in Plunky2 to optimize for different objectives like proof size or proven time. So as I said, it's built for proof recursion. Um, so what is proof recursion? Um, the idea is that you want to generate a proof that another proof is valid. Um, and the easiest way to do so is um, given a proving system with a prover P and a verifier V, you want to write the verifier in a circuit. And there's many applications of proof recursion, uh, but the one that's the most relevant to us is for ZK rollups. So in a ZK rollups, you have a bunch of transactions that you want to um, prove the valid execution of. Um, and what you could do is like just generate a big proof that all the transactions are valid. 
uh, but you will end up with like a very large circuit that will take a lot of time to prove. So what you can do is you can split the transactions, you can split the block in batches of transactions, and then um, prove in parallel all these batches, and then use recursion in a tree-like structure to end up with only one recursive proof that all the transactions in the block uh, are valid, okay? And then these proofs you can push to L1. Okay, so as I said, like you just want to write the verifier in a circuit, so how practical is that? Well, if you try to do that with um, proving systems using elliptic curves, you quickly run into an issue, which is the verifier does arithmetic in both the Bayes and scalar fields of the elliptic curve, okay? And the proving system itself works on the scalar field. So all the base field arithmetic of the verifier will have to be done non-natively. Um, it's totally doable, but the problem is that non-native um, arithmetic um, is very costly in terms of constraints. So you will end up with like a very large circuit. Um, one solution to this problem is to use a cycle of elliptic curves. So you introduce another elliptic curve whose scalar field is the same as the first curve's base field and whose base field is the same as the first curve's um, scalar field. And then um, to verify your proof on the first curve, uh, you generate another proof on the second curve, and then all the original base field arithmetic will be done in the new scalar field, okay? So, so all the base field arithmetic will be able to be done natively, and so you drastically reduce the number of constraints needed um, to write the verifier. Um, there's a couple of issues with this approach. First one is that there's still some non-native arithmetic to do. So all the scalar field arithmetic um, on the first curve will have to be done non-natively on the second curve. And second problem is that if you're trying to do this with um, a proving system using parents, something like Graph 16, um, you will need to use um, very large curves because we don't know any parent-friendly cycle uh, with like reasonable sized curves. Okay. So one breakthrough in, in recursion was a few years ago with Halo. So in the Halo, they use uh, an IPA-based polynomial commitment scheme, uh, which takes a linear time to verify. So at first sight, you would think it's very bad for recursion because like the verification circuit uh, would have to be linear. But they actually found a way using a technique called accumulation to like defer the full verification of the, of the PCS until the end of the recursion. And this accumulation step takes only logarithmic time. So that's how they achieve um, fast recursion. Um, so that's a really great system, Halo. Uh, it's used by many teams. Um, actually, the first version of Plunky was based on Halo. It was Halo uh, and Plunk and Custom Gates. Um, but the, there are some serious drawbacks. Um, for example, the final verification is still linear, so even if the accumulation step is logarithmic, the final verification is linear and quite costly. Um, there's quite a lot of engineering overhead, so like you have to keep track of two curves, and on those curves you have to keep track of accumulators, and also a, a data structure called um, deferred arithmetic, if you want to skip the non-native arithmetic. So when you try to implement all of this, you end up with like quite a complex system. And, and finally, um, Halo is based on elliptic curves and uh, discrete, discrete logarithm. So you need like curves of size at least 256 bits, and those are, are quite slow. Um, so our, our solution to recursion uh, is Plunky2. Um, and it uses a Fry-based polynomial commitment scheme. Um, this has a lot of advantages, first off, First one is that we avoid elliptic curves entirely. Um, so we don't have to do any non-native arithmetic. Uh, we don't need this accumulator technique. Um, uh, we can use any field we want, um, like a small field. Um, and there is no trusted setup and it's post uh secure. Uh, for the arithmetization, we use Turbo Planck. So to write the verifier in the circuit, you need like a powerful arithmetization. If you use something like R1CS, you will end up with lots of constraints. Uh, but Turbo Plunk is like very powerful and you can write the, the verifier in 
few gates. And finally, we need, Fry is based, is based on hashes, so you need the hash function, and we decided to use Poseidon, which is a, an, an arithmetic hash function, and then we have uh, tons of optimizations to make Poseidon fast both in and outside the circuit. Um, as I said, you can use any field you want, like a small field. We use this one called the Goldilocks field. Um, it has a lot of cool properties. Uh, first one is it fits in 64 bits, so it's really fast on CPUs. Um, there's an efficient reduction algorithm uh, to reduce integers um, at the OP. And there's a, some cool features, like uh, if you do a mul add on 32-bit integers, then you don't overflow. So, and there's like other kinds of properties to make computation in this field very fast. Um, here's how the custom gates look. Um, so it's a bit different than um, classical Turbo Planck. First, we have some constants um, in each gate. Those are not part of the witness. Um, they're actually part of the circuit description, so they will be committed to in the verifier key. And then the wires are split in two. There's like routed wires and advice wires. So in classical Planck, you can route any wire uh, between gates, but that's not free. You need to actually then include all these wires in the permutation argument. And so what we've realized is that you don't need to actually have all the wires being routable um, to make the permutation argument a bit um, less costly. And so we have these advice wires which are used for like intermediate computation in the, in the custom gate. And then finally, the custom gate itself is like a polynomial constraint of all these values, the constant and the wires. And what you can do is you can increase the table width and the degree of the polynomial constraint um, to increase the expressiveness of your um, circuit, or of like your, your proving system. All right, and the result of all of this um, is that we can get very fast recursive proofs um, that take 170 milliseconds on a MacBook Pro. So that's orders of magnitude uh, better than what was possible before. And the recursive verifier circuit itself is very small at 2 to the 12 gates. All right, so as I mentioned at the beginning, um, there's a bunch of parameters in, in Planky 2 that you can tune. All right, so by default, the proofs of Planky 2 are quite large at like 115 kilobytes for a classical, for the default uh, recursive proof. But you can tune the parameters to make it smaller. Okay, so there's two parameters in Fry, which are called the rate and the number of queries. Um, and they are related, so like if you increase one, you have to, if you decrease one, you have to increase the other to keep the same level of security. Um, but so what you can do is you can increase the rate, for example, and decrease the number of queries, and you'll end up with like a much smaller proof but it will take more time to prove. Okay. Conversely, you can reduce the rate and increase the number of queries to get much faster proving times, but a larger proof. And using recursion, you don't actually ha have to choose. You can compound the benefits. So like if you have uh, an intensive task to prove, you can prove it using a small rate, okay? So like the proving time will be much better. And then you can recursively verify this proof uh, using a, um, a high rate to get like a, a smaller proof in the end. All right. Another parameter in Fry is the hash function itself. So if you want to recurse on your proof, you need a, a algebraic hash function like Poseidon. Uh, but if you don't need recursion, you can use any hash function, okay? One example where you don't need to recurse is the final proof uh, in the ZK rollup. This proof is pushed to L1 and is verified on L1, so you don't usually need to recurse on this proof. And so you can use a hash function like Ketchak. Uh, this has two benefits. First one is that Ketchak is much faster than Poseidon outside the, the circuit. And second is that Ketchak is natively supported on the EVM, so the cost to verify it on L1 is um, much lower. And also the last proof in the, in the rollup will use a high rate to decrease the proof size, um, to also reduce the cost of verifying on L1. All right, cool thing is that we've implemented all of this. Um, it's open source, it's fully in Rust, uh, it, and it's available on our GitHub. 
Uh, we have a lot of crates included for like all kind of application specific gadgets. Um, so gadgets for U42 arithmetic, non-native arithmetic, um, elliptic curve operations, and ECDSA. Um, and, and we have a REST API to write circuits, so you don't have to learn a new DSL, you can just write everything in REST and use all the gadgets included. Um, another thing I want to talk about is Starkey. Okay. Um, so Stark, Starks and Plonk are actually very similar. The only difference is that in Plonk, Plonk is like a Stark with uh, the ability to route wires between different rows and um, also custom gates. But sometimes you don't need any of those features. One example is in a VM. So in a VM, like the computation is very sequential. Um, and you don't really need custom gates because the VM does the same thing at every cycle. So to prove a VM in ZK, you can actually just use Starks, which are in general much faster than Plonk. And so for that reason, we've built the Starky crate. Um, which gives an API for building Starks in the Plunky2 framework. So it's the same field, the same hash functions, um, the same code in, code in general um, to build Starks instead of Plunk proofs. And a nice thing is that Starky proofs can be recursively verified with Plunky2. Okay, so coming back to our, to our example, if you have like a, a VM intensive task uh, to prove, you can prove it in Starkey, which is faster, and then you can aggregate these proofs with uh, Plunky2 using recursion. All right, um, and this is a rough sketch of the architecture that we're using at Polygon Zero for uh, our ZK rollup. Um, so the base layer is the EVM transactions proof. Uh, we prove them using Starks. So it's not exactly Starkey, it's like Starkey plus um, a lookup argument, but it's based on Starks. And then we aggregate all these proofs using Plunky2 up until the root, uh, which is a recursive proof that all the block is valid. Um, so Plunky2 proofs are quite large, as I said before, so also one thing you can do is like just wrap a Plunky2 proof inside Graph16, um, or like Plunk plus KZG, um, if you want to like even have even lower cost on L1 for verification. All right, and that's all I had to say. Um, if you have any questions. Okay, we have plenty of time for questions if people want to line up at the mics. Um, you said for Ketchak, uh, when you parameterize for Plunky2, that you could uh, increase the rate uh, to, uh, to minimize gas costs, but what if you don't really care about the proof size? Um, does the relationship between the queries and the rate, uh, is that like a smooth relationship before it becomes insecure, or is there like a jump between proving times, like as you increase the the query. All right. Okay. So the relation is that if you multi you if you multiply the number the rate or like the logarithm of the rate, so like seven in the first example, and you multiply times the number of queries, that gives you your security. Sure. Okay. So like there's like a multiplication. So, so, so it is like a uh, like linear relation. Yeah. yeah it's yeah, like yeah, it's okay. like smooth. Yeah. So like you can really tune it as you want. Okay. Um, Thank yeah. you. Hello. A uh, quick question about the slide that you had with the metrics on it, uh, where you said, I think, 170 milliseconds. Yeah. Uh, what specifically does this refer to, as in which processes are accounted for in this yeah. time? Um, great question. So this is for like a recursive proof. It's kind of the fixed point of recursion, right? So like if you mm -hmm. recurse on a very large proof, mm -hmm. it will not take 170 milliseconds. It will be, it will be like larger. But so like, if you have a circuit of two to the 12 gates, to recursively verify it, the circuit is also two to the 12 gates. So that's like the fixed point, and, and this takes 170 milliseconds. Got you, so for basically the second layer of recursion. Yeah, okay. exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, 
and that's for like one-to-one -one recursion. So it, it verifies only one proof. Um, usually in a ZK rollup, you would verify two proofs, right? To like mm -hmm. build a tree. Uh, yeah, so that would be a bit uh, like slower. Okay, and this is using Plonky2 with Fry? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, all, all Plonky2 only works with Fry. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's thank our speaker. Before you go, there are three announcements. The first is that there will be a reception just outside in the hallway there in, I believe, about 15 minutes. We have some evening events. You should check the program. I don't know whether or not there's still capacity, but check the program and sign up if there is. And finally, we'd encourage you to give lightning talks if you're interested. You should submit your lightning talk proposal by midnight tonight. And just a reminder, the lightning talk session is taking place midday tomorrow. Thank you.